My Brother Sam is Dead, Chapter One. It was April, and outside in the dark, the rain whipped against the windows of our tavern, making a sound like muffled drums. We were concentrating on our dinner, and everybody jumped when the door slammed open and banged against the wall, making the plates rattle in their racks. My brother Sam was standing there, wearing a uniform. Oh my, he looked proud. Sam, my mother said. We hadn't seen him since Christmas. Shut the door, father said. The rain is blowing in. That's the way father was. Do right first, and then be friendly. But Sam was too excited to pay attention. We've beaten the British in Massachusetts, he shouted. Who has beaten the British, father said. Sam shut the door. We have, he said. With his back to us, he slipped the latch in place. The Minutemen, the damn lobster backs, marched out of Boston yesterday. They were looking for Mr. Adams and Mr. Hancock, and they marched up to Lexington. Some of the Massachusetts Minutemen tried to stop them there in the square, but there were too many British, and they got through and went up to Concord looking for ammunition stores. But the Patriots got the stores hidden mostly, and they didn't find much. And then when they turned around and went back, the Minutemen hid in the fields along the roads and massacred them all the way back to Boston. Nobody said anything. They were silent and shocked. I couldn't take my eyes off him. He looked so brave. He was wearing a scarlet coat with silver buttons and a white vest and black leggings halfway up to his knees. Oh, I envied him. He knew everybody was staring, but he liked being the center of attention. And he pretended it was just an ordinary thing and he was used to it. I'm starved, he said, and he sat down at the table. Started out from Yale at six o'clock this morning and didn't stop to eat all the way. There were seven of us at the table in the tap room. Mother and father and me were there. Then there was the minister, Mr. Beach, who lived in Newtown, but spent Saturday night here in Reading so he could preach in our church early Sunday morning. Then there was a couple of farmers from Reading Center. I didn't know, and of course, Sam. But still, they all sat silent. I guess they figured that it was up to father to speak first, seeing as Sam was his son. My mother got up, fetched a plate from the rack, and filled it with stew from the iron pot on the fire. Then she drew Sam a pot of beer from the tap and put it all down in front of him. He was hungry, and he bent over his plate and began shoving in the food as fast as he could. Don't eat like that, father snapped. Sam looked embarrassed and sat up straight. All right now, father said. Tell us the news again in an orderly manner. Father had a temper, and I could see he was trying hard not to lose it. Sam dug his spoon into the stew and started to fill his mouth, but suddenly he realized that if he began talking with his mouth full, father would yell at him again. So he put the spoonful of stew back on his plate. Well, it's hard to tell it orderly, father. There were so many rumors around New Haven last night that... I thought it might be like that, father said. No, no, it's true about the fighting, Sam said. Captain Arnold told us himself. Captain Arnold? Captain Benedict Arnold. He's captain of the governor's second foot guard. He looked down at his stew. That's my company. He looked up and gave father a quick sort of scared look. That explains the fancy dress, I imagine, father said. Captain Arnold designed the uniform. Never mind, tell the story. Well, the beginning was when the lobster backs. By that, I suppose you mean the soldiers of your king, father said. He was still holding on to his temper. Sam blushed. All right, the British troops from the garrison in Boston. They marched up to Lexington, looking for Mr. Adams and the rest, but they got away. Somebody signaled them from some church steeple in Boston. So when the lops British got up to Lexington, there wasn't anybody there except the Minutemen. Then the shooting started. Mr. Beach put his hand up to stop Sam. Who shot first, Sam? Sam looked confused. Well, I guess the British. I mean, that's what they say in New Haven. Who said? Well, I'm not sure, Sam said. I guess it's hard to tell in a battle. But anyway, Sam, father said, who do you think fired first? I don't know, father. I don't know. But anyway, I should think it might matter to know, Sam, father said. Why does it matter? Sam was beginning to lose his tem temper the way he did. What right have the lobsterbacks to be here anyway? I thought it was pretty funny that he kept calling the British lobsterbacks when he was dressed in red, too. All right, all right, Mr. Beach said. Let's not argue the point. What happened then? Yes, sir, Sam said. So anyway, 
Some men were killed. I don't know how many. And then the British went on up to some place called Concord, looking for the ammunition stores there. But they didn't find very much and turned around and started back to Boston. That was when the Minutemen really peppered them. They chased them all the way back home. Quickly, Sam began to eat his stew before they had time to ask him more questions. Damn it, that's rebellion, one of the farmers said. They'll have us in war yet. Mr. Beach shook his head. I think men of common sense will prevail. Nobody wants rebellion except fools and hotheads. That's not what they say in New Haven, sir, Sam said. They say that the whole colony of Massachusetts is ready to fight, and if Massachusetts fights, Connecticut will fight too. Finally, my father lost his temper and slammed his hand down on the table, making the plates jump. I will not have treason spoken in my house, Sam. Father, that isn't treat. Father raised his hand, and for a moment, I thought he was going to reach across the table and hit Sam. But instead, he slammed it down on the table again. In my house, I will decide what constitutes treason. What have they been teaching you at college? Mr. Beach liked peace. I don't think the people of Reading are anxious to fight Sam, he said. Sam was nervous, but being Sam, he was too bound to argue. You get the wrong idea from Reading, sir. There's a lot more Tories in this part of Connecticut than in the rest of the colonies. In New Haven, there aren't so many loyalists, and in some towns, there aren't any at all. Oh, Sam, Mr. Beach said, I think you'll find that loyalty is a virtue everywhere. We've had these things before, that vicious nonsense of those madmen dressing up like Indians and throwing tea into the Boston Harbor, as if wetting a few hundred weight of tea would stop the mightiest army on the face of the earth. These agitators can always manage to stir up the passions of the people for a week or so, but it never lasts. A month later, everybody's forgotten it, except the wives and the children of the men who've managed to get themselves killed. Sir, it's worth dying to be free. That made father shout, free. Free to do what, Sam? Free to mock your king? To shoot your neighbor? To make a mess of thousands of lives? Where have you been getting these ideas? You don't understand, Father. You just don't understand. If they won't let us be free, we have to fight. Why should they get rich of our taxes back in England? They're 3,000 miles away. How can they make laws for us? They have no idea how things are here. It made me nervous to listen to Sam argue with Father. I could see that Mr. Beach wanted to quiet him down too before he and Father had gotten into a real fight the way they sometimes did. God meant man to obey. He meant children to obey their fathers. He meant men to obey their kings. As a subject of the Lord our God, I don't question his ways. As a subject of his majesty, George the Third, should you question his ways? Answer me this, Sam. Do you really think you know better than the king and those learned men in parliament? Some of those men in parliament agree with me, sir. Not many, Sam. Edmund Burke. Father lost his temper again. He banged his hand down on the table once more. Sam, there will be no more talk on this tonight. He meant it, and Sam knew he meant it too. So he shut up, and the conversation turned to repairs Mr. Beach wanted to make to the church. I was glad too. It scared me when Sam argued with grown-ups like that. Of course Sam was that way, always shooting at whatever came out of his mouth, and sometimes even getting hit by my father for it. Father hardly ever hit me but he hit Sam dozens of times, mostly for arguing. Mother always said, Sam isn't really rebellious, just too quick with his tongue. If he'd only learned to stop and think before he spoke. But Sam couldn't seem to learn that. My mother hated it when father hit Sam for speaking out, but there wasn't anything she could do about it. And anyway, she believed that father was right. Children ought to keep a civil tongue in their heads. I guess he was right. Children are supposed to keep quiet and not say anything, even when they know the grown-ups are wrong. But sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I have trouble keeping quiet myself, although not near as much trouble as Sam. Of course, Sam was almost a grown-up himself. He was 16. He'd been away at college for almost a year, so you couldn't really call him a child anymore. I guess that was part of the trouble. He thought he was a grown-up, and he didn't want anybody to tell him what to do except I could tell that he was still afraid of father. 
But to be honest, I wasn't sure if Sam was right about the fighting anyway. It sounded right when he said it, that we should be free and not have to take orders from people who were so far away and all that. But I figured there had to be more to it than Sam knew about. Father had never gone to college the way Sam had, but still I was pretty sure that he knew more than Sam. Father was a grown up and maybe Sam thought he was a grown up too. But as far as I was concerned, he was just my brother. He couldn't scare you the way father could. Besides, it made me glad to have him come home, and I didn't want him to get into a big fight with father and spoil it. I just wanted him to shut up until dinner was over and we could go up to the loft where we slept, and I could lie in the dark snuggled up next to him to keep warm and let him tell me stories about Yale and the pretty girls he knew in New Haven and getting drunk with his friends and his triumphs and his debates. Sam was a triumphant sort of person. He always had some victories to tell about whenever he came home from college. Mostly they were in debates where he scored, scored a telling point over his enemy or whatever you call him. He would say, and then I scored a telling point to him. He explained to me that the telling point was, which I never understood. And then he'd say, Tim, it was a great triumph. Afterwards, everybody crowded around me saying, that was a telling point maker, a telling point. Sam couldn't boast about his triumphs to father or mother or Mr. Beach or anybody like that because boasting was pride and pride was a sin. But he could boast to me about them because I didn't care whether it was pride or not. They were interesting. And I guess most of his boasts were true. He was always bringing home some book in Latin or Greek with an inscription saying he had won it for some telling point he had scored. Of course, the inscriptions were usually in Greek, which I couldn't read, but I believed him. So anyway, I didn't want Sam to get into a fight with father. It would spoil the fun. And besides, if it was a bad enough fight, Sam might run away. He'd done that a few times after a fight with father. Usually he'd just run away to Tom Warrup's hut up behind Colonial Reed's house. Tom Warrup's was the last Indian we had in Reading. He was the grandson of a famous chief named Chief Chicken, which is a funny name for a chief. He didn't mind having people sleep in his hut. It made a convenient place for Sam to run away to because it was close enough so that he could come home without any trouble after he'd stopped running away. But Sam stayed pretty quiet during supper. The grown-ups didn't pay any attention to him, but I kept looking at him to admire his uniform and I could see that he was thinking about something. It worried me that it was something else for him to get into a fight with father about. But finally supper was over with and he'd stayed quiet, and I figured he was safe. The grown-ups got up. Sam, are you going to help me with the milking? I asked. I can't. My uniform will get dirty. Take it off, then. I could see he didn't want to do that. My other clothes are still at Yale. Borrow some from father. All right, all right, he said. Go on out to the barn. I'll come in a minute. I knew he'd stall as long as he could, but I went out anyway, so as not to get into a fight with him myself. The barn was out behind the house. Actually, the house is partly a store and partly a tavern, too. The main room is a tap room with a huge stone fireplace and barrels full of beer and whiskey and cider. There's the big table in the middle with benches down the sides and then at the opposite end of the fireplace, more barrels and bins full of things we sell to the farmers around Reading Center and Reading Ridge, which is our part of the town. We sell things like cloth and needles and thread and nails, knives and spoons, salt and flour, pots and pans, and some tools. Although mainly, if anyone wants tools, they have to go to Fairfield for them. Behind the tap room is the kitchen. There's an even bigger fireplace there. In fact, it takes up one whole wall. And of course, cupboards for storing food and hams hanging from the ceiling and salted beef and salted fish in barrels and honey in jars and wheat in sacks. And out through the kitchen door, there's the muddy barnyard and back of that, the barn. We have a cow named Old Prue and a horse named Gray and some chickens, ducks, and geese. And the old sow and six young pigs. Sam and I used to look after the animals, but after he went to college, I had to do it all by myself. I hate doing it. It's just a lot of work. I went out. The barnyard was muddy for the, from the April rain. I jogged across it, trying to find the least muddy spots, and went into the barn. Old Prue mooed at me. 
She was tired of waiting to be milked. I got down the wooden bucket from its hook and started to milk her. It's a boring job and your hands get tired. I kept hoping Sam would come out so I could talk to him without the grown-ups around. But he didn't come, so I began to daydream about being older and going to Yale with Sam and scoring some telling points myself and Sam being proud of me, even though I know that daydreams are sloth and sloth is a sin. And I got pretty far along in the daydream before Sam came in. He still had his uniform on. Are you going to help me with the animals? I asked. I wasn't going to, but mother said that idle hands make the devil's work. All right, I said, you can pitch down some hay. I'll get my uniform dusty, he said. He picked up a straw and leaned against the wall, picking his teeth. I thought you were going to change. I couldn't find anything else to wear, he said. That's a lot of swill. You just want to show off how famous you are. Not at all, Tim. I'd have been pleased to help and been able to find suitable clothes. I pointed old Prue's tea at him and gave him a squirt. Milk splashed on the knee of his trousers. Damn, he said, jumping back. You little brat. He wiped off his trousers. Help then, I said. All right, I'll collect the eggs. What on earth happened to this basket? I'd stepped on it once when I was mad. It got broken, I said. I can see that, he said. How did you manage to do that? Old Prue stepped on it, I said. Just put some hay in the bottom. God, can't you do anything right, Tim? Don't curse, I said. It's a sin. He picked up the basket. How am I supposed to collect eggs with a hole in the basket? Stop complaining, I said. I have to do this every night while you're down at Yale scoring telling points and getting drunk with those girls. You know I wouldn't do anything like that, Tim. Drunkenness is a sin. I giggled. So is, what's the world for girls? Lasvaciousness? Lasvaciousness, stupid. Not lasvaciousness. I have a new song about girls, but it's too less spacious for you. Please sing it to me, I begged. No, you're too young. No, I'm not. Besides, if you don't sing it to me, I'll tell father how many times you've got drunk. Shh, all right, I'll sing it later, he said. This basket is hopeless. Isn't there another one someplace? There's a new one hanging up over there, but we're not supposed to use it. Why not, Sam said. What can they do to me? I didn't like when he talked like that. It bothered me. Listen, Sam, why do you always have to get into a fight with father? Why does he always have to get into a fight with me, Sam said. He had got some hay in the basket and was hunting eggs under the hen roost. That isn't fair. He pays for you to go to Yale and sends you money for books. You ought to be nicer to him. You knew he'd get into a rage when he saw you in that uniform. Sam stood there staring at me with the broken egg basket in his arms and I knew he was trying to decide whether or not to tell me something. I had enough sense to keep still. Sam pretty usually blurts things out if you pretend you're not listening and don't beg him to tell. I went on milking old Prue. Finally, he said, suppose I told you I had to wear the uniform for a reason. That gave me a shiver. I don't believe it, I said. I did believe it, but the best way to get him to tell was to not get all excited. It's true, Tim. I'm going to fight the lobsterbacks. That scared me, but it excited me too. I wondered what it'd be like to shoot somebody. Still, I said, I don't believe you, Sam. Oh, you'll believe it soon enough. Tomorrow I'm walking up to Weathersfield to meet my company. Then we're going up to Massachusetts to fight the lobsterbacks. I believed him, all right. Won't you be scared? Captain Arnold says it's all right to be scared. The true brave man is always scared. At least that's what the sergeant said, he said. You seem to be pretty proud of Captain Arnold. Oh, he's a marvelous horseman and brave and doesn't take any nonsense from anybody. He'll lead us through the lobster backs like a hot knife through butter. He started collecting eggs again. You're really going to Massachusetts, I asked. It seemed like a long way away to me. To Boston? I don't know exactly. I think we're supposed to go to Lexington, Sam said. An egg fell out through the bottom of the basket. Damn it, Tim, why don't you fix this thing? I did fix it, but it broke again. I didn't say it was a month ago, and I was too lazy to fix it. Again, laziness was sloth, and sloth was a sin. Tell me about the war, I said to change the subject. I told all I know at dinner. Why did you come home, I asked. He stopped hunting for eggs and stared at me again. Finally, he said, I can't tell you. Why not? You'll tell father. 
No, I won't. I swear I won't. I shut my mouth. With Sam, it was the wrong thing to beg. Yes, you will. All right, don't tell me then. I don't care. I don't believe any of it anyway, I said. I had old Prue nearly empty and began stripping her teeth to get the last drops of milk out, as if I'd forgotten all about what Sam was saying. He didn't say anything for a minute. Then he said, Will you really swear you won't tell? I thought you said you weren't going to tell me. All right, I won't, he said. I swear, I said. On your honor? Yes. This is serious, Tim. I swear on my honor. He took a deep breath. I came to get the brown bess. That shocked me more than him saying he was going to fight. The brown bess was a type of gun most everybody around Connecticut had. It was brown and got its name from Queen Elizabeth, whose nickname was Bess, because they first used that type of gun a lot during her time. The gun was about as long as I was tall and had a bayonet around 20 inches long. Father kept the bayonet hanging over the mantelpiece. He used the brown vest for deer, and sometimes when he went out with the other men to go after a wolf that was getting into the livestock. And he took it with him every fall when we went over to Burr Plank's Point to sell cattle and buy supplies for the store. He never met up with any trouble going over to Burr Plank's, but people he knew had sometimes been held up and robbed. So you can see that the gun was important to us. It was one thing for Sam to say he was going to fight the British. They were a long way away from here. But to take Father's gun was pretty bad. Father was right here, and he seemed a lot more real to me than the British did. Sam, you shouldn't do that, I said. I told you it was serious, Sam said. Now I wished he hadn't told me. You oughtn't to do it, Sam. Father will kill you. If I don't have the gun, some lobster back will kill me. Besides, it belongs to the family, doesn't it? I have as much right to it as anybody, don't I? I knew that was wrong, and I shook my head. It doesn't belong to the family. It belongs to father. Neither of us said anything for a minute. Then Sam said, You swore to me. You swore an oath. I wished I hadn't. I was afraid to go back on my oath. But I was just as scared of Sam stealing the brown best, too. Let's finish up with the stock and go to bed. I figured if we went to bed, he'd fall right asleep because he'd walk 30 miles up from New Haven that day. In the morning, we'd all have to go to church. It was the law to go to church on Sunday. And it would be hard for him to steal the gun with people milling around and coming over to the tavern the way they did after church. I finished milking old Prue. Sam took the eggs up to the house and came back, and we fed the stock and watered them. We didn't say much. I knew that Sam was sorry he'd told me, and I was thinking of ways to stop him from doing it. Finally, we were through. Let's go to bed, I said. All right, he said. Go on up. I'll be up in a minute. I want to talk to Father. Please come right up, though. Don't worry, Tim. Just go up to bed. I didn't want to leave him, but I knew there wasn't any use in arguing. So I said good night to father and mother, said some prayers, and went upstairs. There were four bedrooms on the second floor of our house, where lodgers stay when we have them. We get a lot of people traveling through between Stratford and Danbury and Lynchfield and Norwalk, or even going over to New York, and they need places along the way to sleep. Above the second floor is the loft where Sam and I sleep. There isn't much in it, just a couple of beds, there are no stairs up to the loft, just a ladder. I climbed up, not bothering to take a light. I knew where everything was. Besides, there are cracks in the floor, which let little pieces of light through, so you can see a little if you have to. I undressed, got into bed, and pulled the blankets over me. I was always pretty tired by the time I went to bed, with all the chores I had around the tavern every day. But I wanted to stay awake and wait for Sam so he could tell me some stories about telling points. To keep from falling asleep, I lay on my back, staring up at the black and watching the dots shift around in front of my eyes. But my eyes kept closing, so I began reciting all the books of the Bible from first to last, and I got to somewhere around Abadiah before I fell asleep. When I woke up, somebody was shouting. I sat up in bed. It was Father. I couldn't hear the words, but I could hear the sound his heavy, hard voice going on and on. Then there was Sam's voice, and he was shouting too. 
and then father again. I got out of bed, climbed quietly down the ladder, and crouched by the top of the stairs. You're not having the gun, father shouted. You are not going to Weathersfield, and you are going to take off that uniform right now. If you have to go to church tomorrow naked, father, I will not have subversion. I will not have treason in my house. We are Englishmen. We are subjects of the king. This rebellion is the talk of madmen. Father, I'm not an Englishman. I'm an American, and I'm going to fight to keep my country free. Oh God, Sam, fight. Is it worth war to save a few pence in taxes? It's not the money, it's the principle. Principle, Sam? You may know principle, Sam, but I know war. Have you ever seen a dear friend lying in the grass with the top of his skull off and his brains sliding out of them like wet oats? Have you ever looked into the eyes of a man with his throat cut and the blood pouring out between his fingers, knowing that there was nothing he could do? In five minutes, he would be dead, yet still trying to beg for grace and not being able because his windpipe was cut in two. Have you ever heard a man shriek when he felt a bayonet go in through the middle of his back? I have, Sam, I have. I was at Lewisburg the year before you were born. Oh, it was a great victory. They celebrated it with bonfires all over the colonies. And I carried my best friend's body back to his mother, sewed up in a sack. Do you want to come home that way? Do you think I want to hear a wagon draw up one summer's morning and go out to find you stiff and bloody and your eyes staring blank at the sky? Sam, it isn't worth it. Now take off that uniform and go back to your studies. I won't, father. They were silent. It was terrible. My heart was pounding and I could hardly breathe. Sam, I'm ordering you. You can't order me anymore, father. I'm a man. A man? You're a boy, Sam. A boy dressed up in a gaudy soldier's suit. Oh, he sounded bitter. Father, go, Sam, go. Get out of my sight. I can't bear to look at you anymore in that vile costume. Get out and don't come back until you come dressed as my son, not as a stranger. Father, go, Sam. There were sounds. I could hear Father breathing as he climbed a mountain. Then the door slammed. I was afraid Father would come up, so I slipped away from the top of the stairs and began to climb the ladder up to the loft. But then I heard some more sounds, some funny ones, sounds I'd never heard before. They puzzled me. I slipped back to the stairs and softly began my, to ease myself down one step at a time. About five steps down, I could see into the tap room. Father had his head down on the table and he was crying. I'd never seen him cry before in my whole life and I knew that there were bad times coming.